You know, life jackets are true life savers, but they won't work if you don't wear them. In 80% of boating accidents where a person drowned, the victim was not wearing a personal flotation device. The TWRA reminds us that anyone 12 years of age or younger, by law, must wear a life jacket anytime they're in a boat. Remember, they float, you don't. On this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal, TWRA Streams crew take a tour of the Duck River to see what fish might be lurking in one of the most biodiverse rivers in the world. And we'll learn all the ins and outs of the fantastic shooting range at the Stones River Hunter Education Center in Nashville. Fisheries biologists hit the lake trap netting crappie to count how many young ones there are this year to ensure great fishing for the years to come. Marshall County's Run for the Hungry participants raise funds for the Hunters for the Hungry program. Hey, borrow them and then we'll, we're going to pitch them back in. Kids get to try their hand at fishing during the great summer games of Robertson County. And we'll get to watch as Springfield Fish Hatchery staff prepare to breed sauger to stock into Tennessee's lakes and streams. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is opening the cover and inviting you in for a behind the scenes look at the work being done every day by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Let's turn the page. What kind of legacy will we leave when our days upon this earth are gone? Tell me who will carry on this work that we've begun. Care enough to be the keeper of the dream. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We start today's show off with a field trip with our streams crew on the Duck River. I've been doing uh, streams and rivers for about 20 years now. I've been on Duck River multiple times and this is about probably the fifth time I've gone from uh, stem to stern on the river. So for the Region 2 stream program, we're in charge of looking at the elk, the duck, the harpeth, the red, all these different streams that we've got in Middle Tennessee. Uh, we're wrapping up our summer study on the Duck River. We've been everywhere from Mullins Mill up in upstream of Shelbyville towards the dam all the way down to Hurricane Mills uh, where it's uh, getting close to Kentucky Lake and the big water. You know, the, the Duck River, you're looking at what, 284 miles long from, from beginning to end, roughly. It's the longest river contained in a single state. Um, it runs all the way from the, uh, the Highland Rim all the way to Kentucky Lake. And it's so biodiverse, it is unbelievable. We've got more species in one square foot than some of the rivers or countries in Europe. So we're taking this pretty big boat, it's a 17 footer and running it through a couple inches of water over some of these shoals uh, and, and navigating around stumps to get this gear where, the, uh, where we need to get our data. So it's uh, definitely pretty exciting. Um, a little harrowing at times, but it's uh, a fun part of the job. The agency started the string crew, I want to remember in the 70s sometime. Uh, Dickie Wilson and uh, uh, Rob Todd and a few others. They started the first original inventory of the state of Tennessee. And in the mid 80s, in 1986, when we started one that went full time. And that full time, we're constantly picking anywhere from five to 15 streams a year and doing population surveys. And on the sports side of it, we're doing samples up and down the rivers that people were fishing for, the smallmouth and the trout and rock bass and things like that. So uh, it, it keeps us busy. See how red his tail is? Oh, mm. oh, 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 People have discovered the rivers again. We're not going to get any more lakes. It's, uh, probably the chances of building lake are about slim to none. So everybody's discovering the, the way to float the river and the kayak. They have more or less came back home. There's a reservoir crew. They handle the big lakes. 
but there's a lot of people that buy fishing licenses there to go, go fishing in these smaller rivers, these creeks. So we got to go where the anglers are. We got to follow the kayakers and just figure out uh, what ways can we best manage that fishery for everyone. It's kind of hectic up there. The front end, you're constantly swiveling back and forth, checking each side of you. We're looking at, you got to make an instantaneous decision. Okay, is that the type of fish I'm going after? Is that not the type of fish I'm going after? You're making a snap judgment. A lot of times your snap judgment is wrong and you have to toss that fish back. But at the same time, you want to try to get every fish that you can. And your targeted species, you want to make sure you get every one of them. That's impressive. Just making a 30 minute run, going through with our electro fishing boat and looking at how the uh, the population is structured. Smallmouth. Making sure we're getting the little fish, the medium fish, the big fish. Spotted bass, rock bass. The different species as well. That lets us know that the recruitment's going right, on. Smallmouth. Also lets us know that uh, the fish are healthy when they're little. 472, which is 18 and a half inches long. And also when they're adults as well. We're collecting the data and we are monitoring that. Now we could lower the creel limits or raise the creel limits, what the number that you could eat, or we can put a size limit on it. So the biologists get together every year with all of our data and they look at it and say, okay, is this creek maintaining itself or is this creek need some help? So that's what they're looking at with our data. And we've got a new thing coming up and they should post it on in the next couple of months, the top five smallmouth streams. We're putting GIS coordinates on the internet so you'll be able to go to places and fish. When people look and see that boat go down the river, they say, oh, it's the game wardens. Well, TWRA has three different divisions. We have the fisheries, the wildlife, and the law enforcement. And we're not out there enforcing the law. We're out there looking at what you're catching. So we're not, per se, all out there writing tickets. We're out there trying to help you catch fish. Next up, the Stones River Hunter Ed Center. It's called the Hunter Education Center. We teach the uh, Tennessee uh, Hunter's Education class here. There's about one class a month taught here. September, October, and November, there's several more classes taught during that time. The range opened uh, for business on October the 3rd of 2003. Uh, the main purpose for it to be here is or the a place for the general public to come and have a good, safe place to shoot. We have rifle range, pistol range, but it's just open to the public. To come to the gun range, first thing you need to know is all guns, when you get out of the car, must be unloaded and in a case. Does not make any difference if you have a handgun carry permit. The gun needs to be unloaded and in a case. Um, it's $8 to shoot for two hours of shooting time. You have to have eye and ear protection the entire time that you're here. That's pretty much all that you need to have when you come here. If you do not have a case, if you do not have eye and ear protection, we have those here. We can provide those for you. There's a small fee associated with that, but we can ensure that you can shoot. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and pull the target up right away. You know, our biggest demographic is obviously uh, men. Uh, men shoot more guns than anybody else, but I have strived ever since I've been here to run this range geared toward the family. Uh, I do my best to tamp down any kind of foul language targets that might be offensive to women or children. You know, we, we keep the facility very clean. You know, I strive to run this range to where it is very, very family friendly. We want the, the father, mother, and the, and the kids to come. We have three different ranges here at the Stone River Hunter Education Center. We have a handgun range, which goes out to 50 feet. We have a rifle range that has 18 lanes that goes out to 100 yards. And then we have two lanes that go out to 200 yards. And then we have a third range that is used mostly for handgun carry permits and law enforcement training. But in the fall, when we get really, really busy, we do open it up and allow the shooters to shoot there too. Uh, and it, it's, it's exactly the same as our other rifle range and it goes out to 100 yards. You're gonna find that this is a very, very safe range. We have an inspection station where we check every weapon that comes in to make sure that that weapon is unloaded. And there's no obstructions in the barrel so that when you get on the range and get ready to fire, that your gun is gonna fire and it's gonna be safe. She fire, she fire. Remove the magazines and load and clear your fire and lock it. On the range, we have range safety officers that control the range, call the range hot and cold. 
and just make sure that everybody's handling their firearms safely, just warding off anything that might be uh, dangerous and in causing any injuries. When you come to Stones River to shoot, it, you know, especially if you're sighting in your deer rifle or whatever, we have spotting scopes, rifle vices, uh, sandbags, you know, anything like that to help you get your gun steady. We have those here for you. There's a small fee associated with those, but you know, when you're getting ready to go out into the field, you want to make sure that your gun is sighted in the best of your ability and that any problems, if you miss in the field, you want it to be your fault, not your equipment's fault. This time of the year, we have lots of deer hunters coming and they're, they're just fine tuning, they're checking their weapons. Maybe they hadn't been shot from last year. They've been stored, um, just making sure that they're still on target. We get a lot of people that's bought new guns or new scopes and they're coming here, making sure those guns are ready to go for the upcoming hunting season. We're only open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. Uh, right now, starting the 1st of November, we'll be open Friday and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Sunday, we're open 1 to 4.30. We'll stop selling tickets and the gate closes at 3.30. We have shooters all the way from, from beginners to you know, the most expert shooters. This is the place that you come to to learn to shoot or practice to shoot or just to get better or just to stay at the top of your game. Hey, let's go trap netting for crappie. It's October again, and water temperatures are cooling up from the summer hot temperatures. The crappie are starting to move back up in the shallow waters. And this is the time of year when we look for the, the small crappie that were spawned back in the spring. This is just a, a model of what we're using. We usually sit 10 of these a night and we leave them overnight for a 24 hour period and then we'll run them the next morning. White crappie? So we're looking for the small crappie that were roughly five inches and smaller. We consider those ages, young in the year or age zero fish. White crappie 130? Essentially what it is is we'll tie this wing wall is this front section of the net. We'll tie it to the bank and we'll stretch this net out perpendicular to the bank and it lays on the bottom like this. If you have a slope, it lays on the bottom and then we anchor it on the far end. The fish will actually swim down the bank and they'll run into this wing wall and then they'll turn and go into the series of hoops. And each one of those hoops has a slot or an opening in it and they end up getting trapped in those hoops. And then they'll be there till the next morning when we can come and then we take measurements off the fish and, and turn, them, turn them loose. White crabby, 112. In the three lakes we work, we would like to see two or three young of the year crappie per night, per net night. And Cheatham, we set 40, essentially 40 nets, so that's 40 net nights. And ideally, we'd like to see at least two or three young of the year per night. In the past eight or 10 years, a really good number of fish for us is four to five young of the year per net night. 230 and 260. We're not really getting a population estimate, but we're looking down the road for two to three years from now. You know, this fish right here is sort of at the, the large end of the range that we consider young of the year. He's he's right under 130 millimeters, so about five inches. So, but we see young of the year crappie that'll be from one and a half to two, three inches this time of year. So there's a, there's a wide growth range on them. So if we do have a poor recruitment year, uh, we can request tax tree stock to, to put in the lakes to try to counterbalance those effects of those poor recruitment years. So in two to three years down the road, these fish that were spawned this spring will be of 10 inch size limit where they'll be available for the fishermen to harvest. We're, we're in the, the business of, you know, making available the, the resources to the public and, and where we can improve on it, we, we try to do that. Our next story is a special run for the hungry. Okay. That's everybody's finish line is, is right back there. It's called Run for the Hungry, Marshall County Hunt, Run for the Hungry. Set, go! It started with the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. They started the Hunters for the Hungry program. And we have started a, uh, a program here in Marshall County to where all the funds to process the deer are given through local donations and fundraising events. And this event is one of those fundraising events. We started uh, uh, a run, it was a 5K run, we offered it, and the public just jumped on it. 
know, and they, they love events like this. Plus, the cause is such a good cause that they uh, were willing to come out and give, give their money and their time. Uh, the registration fee is $40, which processes one deer. The, uh, the people, the local community, and now, I mean, we're, we're getting people from, you know, all over the state come and run, and it, it has been a big hit. And through the years, we've added a 10K, we offer it. About three years ago, we offered a triathlon where they run three miles, they'll kayak three miles, and then they'll bike six miles. And they are kayaking on the Duck River, and everybody seems to love it. The processor is, uh, is located in Lewisburg, and the deer hunters would donate the deer, and, and the meat would be given to the local food bank and the church missions and they would come by and pick the meat up and distribute it to the needy families that came through. The uh, problem was is that we were running short of funds and we needed the money to process the deer because a lot of hunters wanted to donate the deer. It started with 25 deer being donated and then it has grown uh, for the past couple of years close to 200 deer per year were donated. We have a lot of uh, people that don't hunt that want to contribute to the to the uh, the cause, and it's feeding the hungry people of Marshall County is what this program is about, because the meat stays here in Marshall County. It's sad to say that we have that many families that need that help, and they are uh, really thankful for this opportunity to be able to get this meat. The, the missions and the food banks have said that the deer, their normal meat runs out, but the amount of deer that's being donated and, and processed uh, carries them through the year. We have wildlife officers that do it. We have um, housewives that, that love to run, love to exercise. We have people that have never ran or, or done anything. You know, they just want to come and, and contribute to it and have some fun at the same time. It just worked out great. The, the public has just, you know, embraced it. And uh, I couldn't have, have done any of this without a lot of help. Henry Horton State Park, you know, letting us have it here. I have a church group. They have a wildlife group at this East Commerce Baptist Church that helps out tremendously. A company called Talus, they come and volunteer their time and just different groups, you know, will come and, and help out. We've done it for uh, about eight years now, I think. But if, as long as the, the hunters are willing to donate the meat, as long as we have hungry people, then this is a, a great, great way to help them. Next up, great summer games for Robertson County. I know a lot of you, some of you may be a little squeamish about putting a worm on there. Just something just sort of, you jump in and you do it. Uh, we're not keeping any of the fish, are we? We're just, we're throwing everything back. So we'll catch them, we can look at them and admire them and then we'll, we're gonna pitch them back in there. It's called the Great Summer Games of Robertson County. Uh, these kids are both at-risk kids as well as junior counselors and we've got our kids here as well as some other children here that are good role models. Group of three, who's the leader? Need worm? Uh, these kids have been nominated by guidance counselors, by um, a juvenile court, by their teachers um, that need a little help, just kind of on the bubble, not really you know, what everybody else would consider bad kids. Oh, I got another one. They do a week-long day camp, and um, they've, um, I want to say, like I said, it's been going on for about five years, and uh, I think we were in on it from, from the get-go. We wanted to get them, take them fishing, get them outdoors, and get them doing some things. Good job, Ariana. You give, a, you give somebody a pole, and you teach them how to fish, and you give them the opportunity to do something like that, and it makes a huge difference in the kids because there's access to water everywhere. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I can't get it off. You kind of put your hands on science that you're learning in school as well. So it's, it's something that we all enjoyed and it's something that we were, that really kind of brought us through our formative years. So it was just something that we thought naturally needed to be with the camp. 
here, let me help you. It does teach the helpers to be patient, because I mean, because <laughs> you, you can come up with something, you look at this rat's nest, and you try to try to clean it up. But I think it teaches them patience some, too. And, and uh, you look at it, there was, I didn't see, there wasn't any drama out here. You know, they all seem to be getting along really well, too. And I don't know if what has fishing has to do with that, but they were all, everybody I saw was interested in it. There wasn't, uh, you know, even the ones that were sitting there messing with their iPhones a little bit, they were still interested in what they were doing and enjoying it. I'm going to say 16.25. The big fish would be Noah. And then we give away big fish, smallest fish. I think uh, Charlie and them want to give their best helper, give them a, a prize and, and uh, it's different things like that. We don't just, you know, go by biggest fish or number of fish. We, we, we spread it out. The person that picked up the most trash got a prize today. The man had passed away a few years ago. Uh, Billy Whitehead, but it was a huge fisherman, a big crappie fisherman. And uh, his sons came in to settle the state and had all this fishing stuff. So they gave me a bunch of fishing stuff to, to add to this. I told them what we did. And uh, so every kid got a couple of lures put in there. A lot of it's just the soft baits and stuff like that. But, you know, they, they heard about that and they thought that was a good deal. So everybody gets something. She's the smallest fisherman, but she caught the most moss of anybody at one time. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. This is my fourth one. Thanking the landowners for letting us, you know, come and use a place like this. You know, having uh, members of the, of the public that that care enough to let you come and use their property, and and because uh, I, I guarantee you there were more trampling around and and stuff that went on here today than they they're used to. Uh, Mike Bernie and his wife were gracious enough to let us come out here and fish. He and his wife both are uh, very big with working with kids and things, and this was just another part of it. Oh, come here. What? Uh, every year, it, it, my, I guess my goal is to take a kid that has never caught a fish and let them catch their first fish and see a little bit about what it's about. You know, just in, just the basics on, you know, putting a worm on a hook and catching a bluegill. And if we can do that, you know, even if it's just one or if it's just a little one, I figure, you know, it's been a, it's been a good day. We'll finish off today's episode with a story about the Springfield Fish Hatchery and their work with Sauger. We're at Springfield Fish Hatchery, and this morning we started harvesting our Sauger brood for the annual Sauger production. The reason we had our fish in a pond is, is a couple years ago, we found it to be a lot easier that we can collect the brood at the end of winter and throughout winter versus trying to scramble and collect all the brood this time of year right before we spawn. So we were able to to feed the fish for you know a month or two months and get them in good condition and get them ready to spawn. We are uh, sexing the fish, uh, male or female, and separating them into uh, one tank or another and then we're injecting them with a hormone to induce them to spawn quicker. And we're inducing ovulation just like you would in a, in a human being and, and uh, the males uh, are always ready. You know we, we brought some in this morning you know that were, that were flowing milk just like in humans, there's a there's a window that you have to, to catch with these fish ovulating. Otherwise, our spawns will be non-productive. We shoot uh, typically for about 25 females and about 50 males. We use, we do two to one ratio, two males to every female, and that helps with our genetic diversity as well as our fertilization rates. All right. One more, number six, female. So this first batch, we're gonna wait 72 hours, re-inject those, and then we're really gonna start watching for, for the females to ovulate. And after that second injection, you know, I'm checking these fish two to three times a day because if we, if we miss that window, uh, you know, our, our spawns aren't gonna be very productive. But we'll typically produce, depending on the size and fecundity of each female, we can get about a million eggs. With Sauger, if we can get half of those to actually produce fry, you know, 50% in the hatchery system is a pretty good number. It's a comfortable number. You know, some years we get as high as 80%. It just depends. But if we can get 50% of those, which would be 500,000 fry, that's that's a good solid number. Everybody asks, you know, well, well, what do they do in the wild? Well, it's, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but in nature, we know that just based on our, our sauger fishery in Tennessee, that 
that it's not that high in the wild, especially since since the dams are in place now and have, have impeded those natural river run spawning areas that, that Sauger historically used. It may be a, a percent or a half a percent. Let's just say 10% in the wild would probably be a, a really high number to you know, 50% is what we shoot for, or, or as high as 80, uh, we, we feel pretty good. So it's, it's just a, it's a numbers game. So once we stock our fry out of the building into our ponds, we hold them for about 40 days. Just by us holding those fish to, up to that two inch size for 40 days, you know, they've already got a, a head start or, or a better chance of survivability than, than a natural fry would out there in the wild. Really, with without producing these in the hatchery system, we may have little or no salt, with exception of those few areas where, where they still have some decent habitat that they can do it on their own. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We'll see you next time. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is produced by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Tell me who will carry on this work that we've begun. Care enough to be the keeper of the dream. This legacy. Our legacy. Hey Tennessee, I'm Kix Brooks. You know, I've been blessed to tour this nation from sea to shining sea. And every time that bus rolls back across the state line, I'm reminded how good we have it here in our home state. Whether you like to hunt, fish, or watch wildlife, we got our Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency to thank for it. But before you follow that red dirt road to your favorite fishing hole or hunting spot, there's one thing you need, a license. Just visit GoOutdoorsTennessee.com and you can get your license in minutes. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniel. When I was a kid, I loved baseball and football and all kind of stuff, but my favorite pastime was when my daddy would get me up early in the morning, we'd go hunting or fishing. Out in the fresh air, on the water, or back in the woods, and you learn a lot. You got kids, take them hunting, take them fishing. Join me, buy a hunting or fishing license. Let's keep wildlife in Tennessee. That's a doggone good thing. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com. Hi, I'm Tracy Lawrence, just letting you know that the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency supports itself and manages all of the state's wildlife with the dollars invested by hunters and fishermen when they buy licenses. If you've never bought a license, but appreciate the abundant wildlife we enjoy in this state, I encourage you to do it. Start with the Type 01. It's a great investment in Tennessee wildlife. Learn more at tnwildlife.org. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com.